So welcome to this webinar on Engaging with Israel, Israel Diaspora Relations, presented by our congregation, Darche Noam. I'm Meyer Simiotiki, and I'll be moderating tonight's program. A big thank you to Marianne Levitsky, our member, who is at the controls hosting tonight's session. And thank you to all of you on screen for joining us for what I know will be, and I imagine you know will be, an informative and thoughtful discussion. As you can see, this session is being recorded. It will be available for viewing in the days ahead. We begin now with a land acknowledgement. As Jews, we have a deep understanding of historical and spiritual attachments to land. Our Darche Noam congregation is located on the traditional ancestral territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, and the Haudenosaunee. Toronto continues to be home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to be able to live and build communities here. As our Shul President Sylvia Hunter recently stated, it's our responsibility individually and collectively to support truth and reconciliation. And we're all encouraged to participate in the learning programs which some of our members are offering on this topic. You can find out more info about that in our weekly Shul events announcement. Tonight, as I said, our topic is Israel diaspora relations today, changing by the minute, it would appear. I imagine we have all recently been following uh, events in Israel with renewed attention, caring, and concern. We're very fortunate to have as our speaker tonight, Professor Derek Pensler, who is a leading historian and commentator on Jewish and Israeli affairs. Soon I'll be introducing Professor Pensler more formally. But first, a big shout out to our Shul's Israel Programming, Programming Committee, which has organized today's session. I'd like to call on the committee chair, Mayor Bester, to extend a few opening remarks. Mayor, over to you. Thank you, Mayor. I will not be long. Uh, good evening and uh, welcome. On behalf of the Israel Programming Committee, I'd like to welcome you all to our second session this year on what's been happening in Israel. And after the most recent elections, there's a great deal to talk about. As Jews, we foster a natural connection with Israel. What Israel does and doesn't do, how it does it or doesn't do it, are always subjects for discussion and often disagreement. You know the saying, two Jews, three opinions. The goal of our committee is to ensure that when such discussions take place, they are based on solid facts rather than on a soundbite from a TV broadcast or a headline on some flyer. Last month, we had a very informative session where we examined the nuts and bolts of the actual election. Who were the main players? How did they get elected? And what are their respective agendas? This evening, we are taking the next step and asking the question, how does this affect us? And more specifically, how does this affect our relations with Israel? We will have more sessions in the coming weeks and months on various Israel-related topics, such as the proposed reforms of the Supreme Court and others. Details will be posted on the Dar Noam's weekly What's On, as well as our website. There's a lot to cover, but that is, that's for the future. At this point, I will turn the mic back to our moderator, Maya Simiotiki, who will let us in on tonight's how tonight's program is going to unfold. Maya, you're on. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor, and again to you and your committee. So yes, let me quickly review how this evening's program will proceed. Professor Pensler will speak for about 45 minutes or so. Spoiler alert, I can report that I've had a chance to preview the slide deck we're about to see and hear about. You won't want to miss any of this talk. After Professor Pensler's presentation, we will have a Q&A period of about 30 minutes. In order to field as many questions as possible, we are asking you to submit your questions directly to me through 
the chat function. And you can do that at any point of the program. And I will then in the Q&A period po pose those questions to Professor Pensler. And now it's a great honor for me to introduce more formally the distinguished Derek Pensler. If I can become somewhat more informal here, Derek is widely known and respected at Darche Noam. He has spoken at our shul often and is a friend to our congregation. Professionally, Derek Pensler is in the highest ranks of historians of the Jewish people and Israel. Currently, he is the William Lee Frost Professor of Jewish History at Harvard University. Before that, he held the chair in Israel studies uh, at Oxford University in Britain. And before that, he was the Samuel J. Zacks Chair in Jewish Studies at the University of Toronto. Derek has written 10 books on a wide range of topics in Jewish and Israeli history. Especially notable relating to tonight's topic are three of those books. His 2006 book, Israel in History, The Jewish State in Comparative Perspective. His 2020 biography, Theodore Herzl, The Charismatic Leader. Many of you may have been at his talk at um, Darche Noam, where just before publication, I believe, Derek, you were kind of rehearsing uh, the main themes of that study. And currently, Derek is working on a book tentatively titled Zionism, an Emotional State. A globally engaged scholar, Derek Pensler, has confided that he still considers Toronto his home. And when not at his writing desk, his favorite place is being with his grandchildren and out in nature. Derek, we thank you for coming home tonight to be with us virtually. The floor is yours, Derek. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you, Meyer. So the, the, the three mayors, the three M's, thank you for the invitation. It's very nice to be back. I wish we were here in, in person, but um, anyway, the advantage is that I get to show slides. So I am going to do that. And so I'm going to share my screen. Just a second. There we go. There it is. There it is. And that's unlaunched. Okay, you should see a launched presentation. Do you? Okay, great. <clears throat> so, you know, the, the, the talk is called Israel, We Need to Talk. And I just I threw this together in the last few days, knowing that things are changing by the moment. And we are, oh, I need to ask me to make sure that people are muted. Um, okay, things are changing by the moment. But there are certain deeper issues at work about the way that Jews in diaspora perceive Israel, have perceived Israel, and are perceiving Israel now. So I'd like to talk about continuities, but then about ruptures, because what's going on now, it's not only a rupture in Israel. There's also, I think, a potential rupture in the way that Jews in diaspora deal with Israel. Um, I'm going to talk mainly about North America, which is what most of my research lately has been on. I will admit that most of my research has been on the United States more than on Canada. Um, and we can talk about comparing them. And I should say that this talk does actually draw on some material from the book that um, the book on emotions and Zionism. I actually finished it. And it's coming out in just a few months. And there are two terms that are going to run through my talk. So I want to raise them right at the start. One is the term civil religion, which refers to a kind of secular belief system in which, um, in the case of Israel, Israel has become, particularly in the last 50, 55 years, the civil religion of North American Jewry. That is, Jews who might not be observant, they might um, not identify Jewishly in a whole variety of ways, but Israel be, is the anchor of their being or a very important part of their being. And that's what the term civil religion really refers to in this talk. The other term I'm using is feeling rules. And those are the rules within a community of any kind, a religious community, an ethnic community, an institution, uh, the rules about what you can say and what you can't say, but even more important, how you can and can't say it, what kind of feelings you're allowed to express 
certain cultures where you can express anger very openly, other cultures where it's frowned upon and so on. So these two terms are actually gonna run through my talk. And I, what I wanna show is how these two concepts have changed a great deal over time. I'm gonna start with um, historical introduction just to understand how we got up to 2022. And then in the second half of the presentation, I'll carry things on from November on to the present to again explain where we are today and just how different it is from where we were um, some years ago. The first thing I, I wanna talk about is Zionism historically, before the state was created, it was not a unifying force for Jews in diaspora and particularly in the United States. Um, this notion that Israel is a unifying force and that we identify as a community with Israel and that this is unquestioning, this certainly wasn't the case when the state of Israel was being formed. Before the 1940s, only a small minority of Jews in the United States belonged to Zionist organizations of any kind. It was a little higher in Canada for a lot of reasons having to do with Canada's political makeup being very different from that of the United States. Eth ethnicity was more encouraged, but there were lots of options to Zionism before 1948, some of which are coming back in, in, in odd ways. For example, Bundism, a kind of a ethnically nationalist Jewish socialism, uh, Bundism is, is experiencing something of a comeback among some younger Jews, at least in the United States. There was har, uh, full bore communism, various forms of non-Zionist orthodoxy, and of course, Jews who believed in assimilationism and that they should be fully American, for example, uh, rather than attach themselves to Zionism. These were all in the air, so much so that let's not forget that one of the most prominent rabbis in Canada uh, during the 1930s, Rabbi Eisendrat of uh, Holy Blossom, a very charismatic and brilliant figure, was himself pronouncedly critical of Zionism. And after the 1929 riots, when um, well over 100 Jews were killed in Palestine, he was speaking on behalf of the Arabs of Palestine, and that the Arabs should not be unfairly blamed for the actions of, of, of a small number. Uh, so again, you could be one of the most prestigious rabbis in Canada in the 1930s and be decidedly non-Zionist. So then comes what I call the first transformation. And by that, I mean the time when Israel became something, if not absolutely central to American or North American Jewish identity, it became much more important than previously. And it really was a product of, of the Holocaust, World War II and the Holocaust, during which time the majority of North American Jews joined Zionist organizations. Memberships in these organizations increased eight or nine fold. Uh, Jewish anti-Zionism largely disappeared organized anti-Zionism disappeared. And we can see just graphic evidence of this in um, a what was called a pageant, a kind of musical, very serious musical display that was uh, performed throughout North America, written by Ben Hecht, starring people like Kirk Douglas, Paul Muni, major Hollywood stars. This is a production of the pageant um, uh, with the Ten Commandments um, in the background, kind of hard to miss them, uh, at the Hollywood Bowl. In this kind of, and, and it featured the, the key of these pageants was the blue and white flag, the Zionist movement, the creation of the Jewish homeland. So this really marked what I call the first transformation. During the 1950s, you know, in North America, people had a connection with Israel, but it was nothing like what came, let's say, in the 1970s and later. Um, there's a very interesting book that I recommend about how synagogue gift shops began to sell Israeli products and um, people began to learn Israeli folk dancing. Uh, and here we see, uh, this is actually um, Camp Mossad in the Poconos, where the counselors um, and the, are, are, are doing Israeli folk dancing. I mean, this kind of thing was going on in the 1950s, but it was not universal. And um, there was a forum in Commentary Magazine in the mid-1960s about you know, what matters about being Jewish. And Israel came up, but it was not uh, at the center of, of one's being. So how and when did things change? Well, um, ironically, I think it was largely um, a novel and a movie. Leon Uris's novel Exodus, and then the movie two years later, so 1958, 1960, was a bestseller for 18 months. The novel was a bestseller for 18 months. And um, it was hugely popular in North America. And I'd be interested to hear from some of you. I've talked to a lot of people who remember reading the book or seeing the movie. For non-Jews, it 
I think it, it, it actually enhanced an already strong appreciation for Israel. And for Jews, it filled them with pride, um, a pride partly in Eurus' story, but also proud that so many non-Jews were excited about Israel. And when you have a film with people like Paul Newman and Eva Marie Saint, well, um, it certainly made the Jews look good. And, and there was growing pride when, in Israel in the 1960s, but the real transformation comes in 1967. It's what I call the second transformation, where North American Jews, Jews in France, the United Kingdom, throughout the Jewish world were really afraid that Israel might be destroyed. And there was a mobilization of diaspora Jewry that had only really approached those levels in 1948 and then rather quickly dissipated. But the way that Jews in Canada and the United States came together to raise money, to, um, to travel to Israel, to work and volunteer on Kibbutzim while the men went off to fight, it was really a moment that the um, diasporic world never really retreated from. The atmosphere after 1967 was one of adulation of Israel. Um, diaspora Jews were besotted with Israel. But the figure of Moshe Dayan, for, for, for example, the one-eyed, charismatic general, the Minister of Defense um, at the time of the war. Here we see a um, comedy album from 1967 by the same people who did um, uh, You Don't Have to Be Jewish, or I think it was the first family. They did great comedy records in the 1960s. Well, here we see a recording on the album cover. All of these comedians are wearing patches on their eyes in emulation of Moshe Dayan. And this kind of adulation it got to a point where Israel became the civil religion of North American Jewry, so much so that Rabbi Arthur Hertzberg, a trenchant observer, but also critic of Israel, wrote in the early 70s, the only offense for which Jews can be excommunicated in the United States is not to support Israel. That is, you can be intermarried, you can be ignorant of the Jewish heritage, you can be an atheist, that's okay, as long as you are vigorously supportive of Israel. And this played itself out into a subculture that flourished in the face of a sense of threat, as well as opportunity. The 1973 war in which Syrian and Egyptian troops attacked the occupied territories, the Sinai Peninsula and the Golan Heights. It, again, it seemed to many diaspora Jews, as well as in Israel, that the country was seriously dangered, endangered. And this was a stimulus that, again, led to a kind of a, um, an assertive, even aggressive, uh, Jewish ethnic uh, nationalism in the United States and in Canada, the popularization of the phrase Am Yisrael Chai, a song that had been written about a decade earlier by um, Shlomo Karabach, became very popular. Buttons like this that some of you might remember, Israel needs you now. Um, this was also an era of ethnic politics in North America. Uh, the, um, African-American, Hispanic-American, Native American politics, feminism. And so Jewish um, Americans, Jewish Canadians developed a much stronger sense of um, passionate attachment to Israel as a form of their own ethnic identity. And this is where you had the real flourishing in the 70s, where Israel becomes absolutely centric to, to the summer camps, gap year programs in Jerusalem in particular, junior year abroad programs, synagogue programs, all the, the stuff that we've been living with for the last half century and that we've taken for granted actually really develops in the late 60s through the 1970s. Um, and Israel simply becomes much more public in American life, in American Jewish life. There's a confidence among North American Jews, particularly in the United States with the growth of APAC uh, under the uh, leadership of Thomas Dine into a, a major player in, uh, uh, in American politics. So there's a sense of, of, um, of attachment to Israel, of pride, and a blanket acceptance of the Israeli government's position on responsibility for the conflict, who was responsible for the 48 war, the 56 war, the 67 war, and so on, but also the most, I'd say, serious issue, the issue of the Palestinian refugees. The Israeli government developed a certain way of accounting for it already in 1948. Uh, that the Arab refugees had, that the Arabs had left their homes voluntarily, that they had been asked or commanded to leave by their leaders. So it doesn't sound like it was voluntary, but this is a contradiction within the story, that they left and they were told that they would come back to a country that had been destroyed and that they would enjoy the, the, the booty of, um, of Jewish property. Uh, this was very rarely the case. And there's a whole literature on exactly what really happened in 1948. It was, I'd say much more of uh, the responsibility did lie in Israel's hands. 
Um, but American Jews, with very, very few exceptions, accepted a view essentially of Israel as a country that does no wrong and um, is kind of a frontier democracy like the United States. And um, uh, there were very, very few voices to the contrary. There was a critical group called Brera, founded in 1974, that lasted only a few years before it was crushed by mainstream Jewish organizations. And it did offer a more critical position towards Israel, although very much a Zionist one, very much a Zionist one. At the time of the Lebanon war, there were a few uh, people who were willing to combine their Zionism with a critique of Israel's military and security policies. Alexander Schindler from the Union of American Hebrew Congregations, so the Reform Congregations, he spoke out against um, the Begin government, as did Philip Klutznik, the president of the B'nai B'rith of America, who actually met Yasser Arafat surreptitiously. So this is going on, but this is so unrepresentative of what North American Jews were feeling and thinking about Israel during the 1970s and the 1980s. And um, the intifadas, 1987 to 1993, and even more so the second intifada, it helped, I think, strengthen whatever tendencies there may have been among some North American Jews to wonder about the occupation and the fate of the Palestinians and to feel that there was something really wrong here. There was a rally around the flag effect when Israel came under fire uh, during the intifadas, um, so much so that in 2002, so when the second intifada was raging, uh, Hillel International, so the international organization of you know, collegiate uh, Jewish institutions, which had previously been very, um, I'd say non-committal about Israel, but it made Israel central to its mission. And they formed, a, there was a kind of side organization uh, funded by Hillel uh, and others called the On Campus Coalition with a motto, wherever we stand, we stand with Israel. This was new. This was not the Hillel of the 1970s, 80s, or even 90s. Hillel had been much more open to a wide variety of perspectives. You didn't necessarily have to be a Zionist, you didn't necessarily have to agree with a certain government line on responsibility for the conflict. So the rally around the flag effect was quite powerful. And we can see ongoing attempts to foster this very deep solidarity with Israel and love of Israel uh, from the 1990s and beyond with the Birthright Project. Uh, now the funding is being reduced for it, but it, it's brought about 700,000 young Jews to Israel for a very intense 10 day experience where what they see is not the real state of Israel. They see a kind of romanticized version of Israel, but, but they, they do so in small groups that foster a great deal of community, emotional community. Uh, as one a birthright participant said, everything seems to have meaning everywhere. You know, it's quite a powerful experience. So um, the civil religion of Israel then, the notion of Israel as being central to Jewish being in North America seemed to be going strong into the 21st century. And as far as what feelings one could express within the mainstream community, well, the only appropriate emotion really was that of love, solidarity, and adulation. And indeed, uh, more and more Jews were going to Israel, more and more Jews were becoming aware of Israel. We can see how the percentage of Jews going to Israel skyrocketed from about a quarter in 1990 to now about half of Jews in North America have been to Israel at least once. Having said that, the percentage of North American Jews who go there often, who've lived in the country for some period, who know Hebrew well, I say it's much smaller, much, much smaller, but that's not surprising. The fact is then that there, I'm talking then about solidarity, engagement, all sorts of things going well into the 21st century. Well, there are other signs though. I can go in the other direction now because despite all of these institutional efforts, despite the gap years and the birthright and all of these synagogue programs and everything, nonetheless, in the early 21st century, uh, quantitative studies began to show that the emotional attachments of, and now this is American Jews, we don't have studies for Canada, that American Jewish attachments to Israel began to decline, particularly among people under 30, 35. It's not that people became anti-Zionist, it's that Israel was no longer very important to them. It was now somewhat important to them. They were no longer very attached to Israel. They were somewhat attached to Israel. So there was a kind of emotional cooling 
in the 1990s, 2000s, um, 2010s, particularly among a younger generation. So that's happening, although technically, uh, theoretically, Israel is still the civil religion of American Jews. There was a huge exception to this cooling, and that was among the Orthodox. Um, about 70% of Orthodox Jews in the United States claim to feel, this is just a few years ago, strongly attached to Israel, only 20% of Reformed Jews. So um, in the case of the Orthodox, it's, you can't really call it a civil religion because Orthodoxy has a whole different way of combining Israel with, um, with religiosity. Now, what you get in the early 2000s, in addition to a kind of emotional cooling towards Israel, is the rise of Jewish critical voices, some of which are Zionists, that is, they believe in the fundamental legitimacy of a Jewish state, some of which are anti-Zionist. So you have J Street, which um, would call itself liberal Zionist. By the way, that's a term that barely didn't exist until 2000. I've studied the the term liberal Zionist only really begins to appear around the year 2000, and its use skyrocketed after that. And then you have groups that are more explicitly anti-Zionist, like Jewish Voice for Peace or, or, or Mondo Weiss. All this is from about, you know, the Jewish Voice for Peace is from the late 90s. Mondo Weiss is from 2000-ish, 2005. Uh, so the, the uh, range of views about Israel already in the 2000s is beginning to change. Well, then... What about the occupation and talking about the Palestinians? What kind of criticism about Israel will be considered licit or illicit? Well, the president of Hillel International said in 2013, you know, you can criticize Israel as long as it's within the context of love. And in 2010, guidelines established by Hillel had said that there's no place in Hillel for someone who, who denies the right of Israel to exist as a Jewish and democratic state. So again, the feeling rules haven't really changed. But there are signs of criticism and of opposition, of defection, and of cooling. All of this is happening long before 2022. Um, interestingly enough, the strongest forms of criticism of Israel coming from within the Jewish mainstream, within Jews who identify as Zionist, was not about the occupation at all. It was about um, religious issues. It was about the fact that orthodoxy dominates the state of Israel. Uh, only about 5% of Jews in Israel identify as reform or conservative, but the number is growing and the non-Orthodox um, uh, communities in Israel suffer all forms of discrimination. The rabbinate, as people know much better than I, controls matters of conversion, uh, recognition of Jewish personal status and so forth. And um, in the last few years, the biggest issue has been that of some sort of egalitarian prayer space in Jerusalem in the Western Wall uh, complex with the government promising, but not fulfilling its promise to allow Jews uh, to pray in an egalitarian manner um, at the Robinson's Arch in the Southern side of the Temple Mount uh, compound. And, and it's interesting that this kind of criticism has been considered okay within the North American Jewish community. For example, supporting women who wish to hold Torah services at the Western Wall. It's an Israeli initiative, but it has a lot of American Jewish support. So, and the people who have been the most critical of Israel in this regard have often been rabbis and Jewish educators and people who are deeply involved in the Jewish community. So all this to say then that there have been levels of questioning about Israel, but they've been kept within very certain limits, right? It's really been limited and there have been um, assumptions that certain things can't be said, certain emotions can't be expressed uh, or else you can't be part of the community. Right, and then everything changes. The third transformation, 2022. People on the far left will say that all we are seeing is a progression of what was already in existence. We're seeing the visibility now, uh, the open uh, um, demonstration of contradictions within Zionism and Israel that have always been there. That may be the case, but I just wanna talk about how Jewish groups in the United States and Canada have reacted to the events of the last few months, because it really, I think we are living in a moment of, of sea change, of Jewish, Jewish groups feeling empowered to say things or compelled to say things that they just wouldn't have said before. Um, now, the first response after the election, this is no December 21st, it seems so long ago, two months ago. This is from AIPAC, okay. 
AIPAC congratulates the people of Israel and Benjamin Netanyahu on the announcement of the new government. Once again, the Jewish state has demonstrated that it is a robust democracy with the freedoms that Americans also cherish. This was a common response by mainstream Jewish organizations right after the election, a celebration that uh, Israel had a free and fair election with a high turnout rate. Um, I can think of some other countries that had free and fair elections with high turnout rates in the 1930s that well, the election results didn't turn out so well. So, but this was the original response, was a celebration. And yet at the same time, uh, people in high positions, usually retired people, that is people who are no longer accountable to a board, to a community, uh, to fundraising, uh, were willing to say things about Israel that were surprising. Abraham Foxman, former director of the ADL, it's very tortuously worded statement. I never thought I'd reach the point where I would say that my support of Israel is conditional. But he says, you know, I love Israel. I want to love Israel. Note the emphasis on the word love. I want to love Israel as a Jewish and democratic state. But if Israel ceases to be an open democracy, I won't be able to support it. So we see some expressions of concern. After all, the government, you all know, and you'll be hearing more about this in, 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 in coming weeks, the governing coalition includes not only the far-right coalition of the Otsma Yehudi, Jewish Power Party, um, Noam, this fiercely um, anti-gay party whose member has already resigned from the government, uh, and religious Zionism headed up by uh, Betzalel uh, Smotrich, um, who celebrated the um, uh, vigilante uh, pogrom in, uh, in Hawara um, uh, yesterday. Um, you know, this is something that's making a lot of Jews in traditional leadership positions in North America concerned. So much so that uh, Hillel Halkin, kind of a, a stalwart of, of um, deeply, I would say, passionate, loving, committed Zionism, an American who moved to Israel many years ago, uh, writes an essay in the rather conservative, centrist Jewish Review of Books uh, about a month, uh, six weeks ago, this time it's different. And in this essay, he uses a word I have never seen before in mainstream Jewish American discourse. He uses the word anguish, not love or frustration, disappointment. That's the kind of word I've, words I've heard expressed, let's say, by rabbis who are upset about the Western Wall issue. They talk about frustration, disappointment. He's using the word anguish. Anguish represents, obviously, the road to utter despair that there's a profound contradiction between your emotional attachments to a cause, to another human being, and what you perceive to be the reality. This is something new. This is different. Now, of course, there was blowback. There are members of the Jewish community in North America who actually are not that upset about what's going on in Israel at the moment. For example, Elliot Abrams a wrote in Commentary Magazine in uh, February, he talked about Jewish hysterics. He basically said that people who predict the um, new government as trying to bring about an end of Israeli democracy through changes in the judiciary, through changes in the relationship and power between the Knesset and the judiciary and so on, that this is all um, simply uh, exaggerated. As he said, uh, officials like Ben Gvir and Smotrich may surprise us. They may learn an office about governing, or they may prove you know, that our fears are accurate. But opposition is not the issue. The real issue is whether American Jews care more about their own illusions or about the Jewish state that actually exists and still struggles each day against enemies who seek every day to kill Jews. So for him, he's saying, look, the real issue is that Israel has enemies. The enemies are the Palestinians and Iran. And, um, you know, the stuff that's going on in Israel, yes, we can complain about it, but it really should not be generating the kind of anger the kind of anguish, these really powerful negative emotions that we're seeing for the first time from mainstream organizations. The funny thing, though, is that in um, Abrams' article, he says, you know, people like uh, Daniel Gordas or Yossi Klein Halevi, they're not upset about what's going on. Well, actually, they are. And here are Jews, um, all of North American origin, these three men, all of North American origin, who moved to Israel uh, and who are not politically leftists by any means. And they wrote what they called uh, an open letter to Israel's friends in North America, um, which reads, whoops, which reads among other things, um, 
basically, yes, of course, certain aspects of these proposed changes, these traditional changes can be found in other countries. You know, this is an excuse that the government is making now that they're simply adopting something from Canada or the United States or New Zealand. Um, but what the, these three, again, very centrist um, uh, individuals, if not right tinged individuals, write that all of these democracies, including Canada, have powerful institutional checks and balances that Israel doesn't have. Israel doesn't have the kind of checks that would prevent the executive or legislative branches from becoming all powerful because Israel doesn't have a constitution. It doesn't have a bicameral legislature. It doesn't have a federal system. There are no states like in the United States or in Canada that can push back against the federal government. It concentrates, the plan of the prime minister will concentrate power in the hands of the prime minister himself. This is not judicial reform, but it's a dramatic change that would essentially make Israel into an illiberal, formally democratic, and then it has elections, but not really a liberal country and not truly a democratic one if we define democracy in terms of protection of human rights and, and of, of, of minorities as well as majority, uh, majority rule. So here we have even centrists, and as I think you know, there are people on the right in Israel, uh, on the far right, uh, actually some of them, uh, including Thomas um, um, David Friedman, the former uh, American ambassador to Israel who were against these, um, these changes. Okay, so this is the reaction that is to which North American Jews are being ex exposed. But there's a question that, that no one seems to have asked yet. And I think this is really central to my talk this evening, which is why? Why is this issue getting, whether it's even um, um, Alan Dershowitz you know, expressed concern about these judicial reforms or Abraham Foxman or, or um, Rick Jacobs, actually my first slide, was a, Rick Jacobs, the head of the um, Association of Reform Rabbis, who's there in, in Tel Aviv last Saturday night speaking uh, at, at a pro-democracy rally. You know, why is this issue, an issue of uh, what power the Knesset has vis-a-vis -vis the Supreme Court or how Supreme Court justices will be appointed or um, you know, what power the attorney general might have uh, regarding a corrupt cabinet minister or something? Why are these issues getting us so worked up. Well, in a way, Elliot Abrams is right that Jews in North America, about 75% of them do identify as liberal. They believe that the values of North American politi uh, liberal pol politics, the values of, again, basic freedoms, um, the rule of law, responsible government, uh, free and fair elections, but also the protection of minorities and of human rights. For many North American Jews, for most North American Jews, these are essential to their being. And they have, throughout their lives, justified their support for Israel by saying that Israel is like us. In the benighted Middle East, so the thinking goes, Israel is a beacon of democracy. In other words, Israel itself has claimed to be, over and again, the only democracy in the Middle East. Jews in North America have accepted that claim. It's actually been their way of being able to deal with Israel's other serious problem that I'll talk about in just a second, to, and to, to see challenges to that brand, to see um, settlers rampaging in the village of Huara, to see, to, to hear the things that Itamar Bengvi or Betzel Smotrich or other people in the government say, um, it's a huge cognitive dissonance because again, in American liberal parlance, democracy is not the will of the majority. It is not the will of the majority. That's not what democracy means in the Western sense of the word. And that's something that Jews as members of a persecuted historically minority group know very well. So this issue has really gotten people upset. But then the final set of questions is, well, what about the other crisis of Israeli democracy? the occupation, the status of Palestinians um, in the West Bank, very different situation in Gaza, a different situation still in East Jerusalem, and different still for the Arab citizens of the state of Israel. But there are ongoing problems ranging from moderate to extreme in the way that Israel has ruled over or dominated another people uh, for decades. 
And this is a, a, a photograph of the cars that were torched in, um, in Huara um, a couple of days ago. Um, well, how democratic was Israel before the November elections? I mean, Israel was a country that effectively controlled the territory between, as they say, the river and the sea, between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River, in which Israeli Jews had full political, economic, social freedoms. Israeli Arab citizens had all kinds of freedoms and rights technically, but have been subject to various forms of structural discrimination. Palestinians in East Jerusalem, more discrimination. Palestinians outside of East Jerusalem in the West Bank essentially are without rights. They are disenfranchised, they have no rights. And, um, you know, was Israel a democratic country before the November elections? In some ways, yes in the way that France was a democracy, say, in the 1950s, when the Algeria was as much a part of France uh, as Paris. Al Algeria actually comprised two départements or sections of France, but the Muslims didn't have the right to vote. 90% of, uh, of the Muslims didn't have the right to vote. The European settlers in Algeria had the right to vote. So was Israel a democracy? Well, was France a democracy, you know, until the French got kicked out of Algeria? In the early 1960s, so this is this is a big question that goes before 2022, um, and this is why I think it's much easier for us, us as North American Jews, it's much easier for us to deal with however worrying or or, or despairing we might sound, whatever anguish we might express, it's much easier to deal with the crisis of of, of Israeli democracy. It's familial, it's internal. It's benenu, it's between us. The fact is that the people in the streets who are supporting or opposing the proposed legislation for constitutional, or sorry, for judicial change, they endorse the idea of Israel as a Jewish state, um, which is why a lot of Palestinians are looking on this crisis with a certain amount of skepticism and confusion because they're seeing it as, well, you know, the Jewish state has always been non-democratic in, in, in a fundamental way, and now we're just seeing another aspect of it. And frankly, there are leftist groups in Israel that feel the same way. Uh, this is a Palestinian um, electronic news site, commentary site called the Electronic Intifada from just a few days ago. Um, so, okay, here we have um, a Palestinian position that Netanyahu telling the vigilantes not to take the law into their own hands belies everything the ruling coalition has said. But then it quotes the Israeli group organization of former soldiers breaking the silence, former soldiers who, who talk and, and write about and document their experience in the occupied territories. Breaking the silence says that the Huara uh, pogrom was state sanctioned violence. And um, this is quoting breaking the silence. Settlers rampaged with impunity because they knew they had the state on their side. So um, this is an element of discourse that's creeping into the Israeli conversation about, about democracy, um, but they really are at this point, at least, in Israel and certainly in North America, they're, they're very separate. Uh, the issue about constitutional reform, I, I hate that term, it's a euphemism, constitutional coup is really what it is, or judicial coup, um, it's just easier to talk about. And this is where I think most of the energy has been focused. Um, and we are seeing unprecedented events and unprecedented responses where even the Orthodox Rabbinical Union condemned the uh, settler rampage, although very, I'd say, making sure to condemn Palestinian acts of terror against Jews in even stronger language, but still um, condemning what the settlers have done. The Orthodox Union has never done such a thing. And there may be people who say they should have done much more, but it's interesting that they did what they did. So what does this lead us to in terms of conclusions? Um, the feeling rules are getting broken. There's new rules about how you can speak. Anger, despair, anguish. Um, and then the question is, will Israel cease to be the civil religion of North American Jews? Will it once again become what it was before 1948, which is actually a bone of contention where some are very attached and, and some are less so? Um, I think that we are going to see a much higher level of, of critical engagement with Israel, of refusing to toe the government line. Um, and there will be either a more dialogic relationship, a relationship of equals between diaspora Jews and Israel, or defection and drift, particularly among younger, younger North American Jews. 
Um, and Israel will become part of the matrix of what it means to be Jewish, but not an essential part. And it's very interesting how, again, I teach young people for a living, and to see how younger Jews are trying to form new ways of being Jewish in which Israel is not centered, or even if it is central, how they interpret Israel and how they define their relationship with Israel is changing. Uh, there will be a darker emotional palette. Again, not just the frustration or disappointment we have expressed, we may have expressed earlier, but anguish and despair, and perhaps the most interesting emotion of all, anger. Uh, anger, I assume that there's probably a lot of psychotherapists, <laughs> social workers in the audience tonight. Um, you know, anger is an expression of unmet needs, and those needs might be quite rational and justifiable. Um, and uh, you can be angry with someone, of course, and still feel quite attached to them, but not feel ashamed to be angry. And I think what we may see are more open expressions of, of anger uh, and, and the right to be angry. So just to sum up the options that I think that Jews uh, in our community and beyond have at this point, it's the three Ds, as I've made up this, this little uh, mnemonic. One is denial. Like what Elliot Abrams said, it's all being blown out of proportion or the reforms are needed. You know, the, the Supreme Court has too much power. Um, you know, these are ne necessary reforms. The people who advocate them might not be the most um, salubrious in the world, but really this is just not a problem. Another is denunciation, which is gonna come from the further left. The crisis is proof of Israel's oppressive and racist nature. That's what people on the far left might say. And then the last is determination. Uh, determination to engage. Uh, and this has been the response so far of the non-Orthodox movements, as well as many Jewish uh, NGOs, uh, not to um, be dissuaded or not to be discouraged, but to engage. But again, to engage in a way that they haven't before, because they really are flying in the face of the Israeli government. Um, but then there's going to be a lot of moral and practical challenges to engagement, if that's what we choose, the third option. Uh, for example, are we actually obliged to take a stand on this crisis? Traditionally, Jews and diaspora would say, well, we don't live in Israel, we don't pay taxes, we don't fight in the wars, therefore, you know, we should not be actively involved. But of course, diaspora Jewish groups have been involved in Israeli affairs in many ways for a very long time. Um, you know, my own view is that we have to decide, are we going to take a stand and then what are we going to do about it? Are we going to link it with the occupation, which is, after all, um, a much more, I'd say, long-standing challenge to Israel's uh, claims to be democratic? Or do we leave it aside? Do we leave it aside for instrumental reasons, that the only way to form a coalition between maybe the center left and the center right is to put the occupation aside? And there are people in Israel who feel that way. And I understand the argument, but there are people who refuse to make that compromise. Um, or do people see no connection between the two? You know, the crisis of Israeli Jewish democracy and issues involving the Palestinians, maybe they're two separate things, but that's a very important decision that we all have to make. We all also have to decide who our allies are going to be. Can the more progressive Jewish organizations that tilt towards non or anti-Zionism, can they be allied with um, mainstream groups? That is, can we have grand coalitions uh, or popular fronts, to use a phrase about the socialist communist alliances from the 1930s. Because the fact is that it's very hard for people on the center left to the further left to build coalitions. I think it's been harder in the late 20th and 21st centuries than it is on the right. Because as we see in the United States from the way Kevin McCarthy capitulated to the far right members of his Republican caucus, and the way that the Likud under Netanyahu capitulated to um, uh, the likes of Ben Gvir and Smotrich, the center right can gain power by capitulating to the extreme, whereas in liberal democratic politics, the center left is less likely to capitulate to the extreme and it becomes harder to form coalitions. So who can we talk to? Who will our allies be? And then last and not least, all of this critical energy, the demonstrations, the expressions of concern and involvement and engagement coming from North America, will this all be lost if, as a result of the tensions in the West Bank, we have an all-out third intifada, which then, and I imagine the government is counting on this, would create a rally around the flag effect 
and would dampen uh, these criticisms and allow the government to push through the changes that it, that it wants to, that would weaken Israel's um, democratic qualities considerably. Okay, well, I should stop there, and I very much look forward to your, um, to your questions and comments. I'm going to uh, stop my screen share, and then I'll be able to see all of you. Okay, so close that. Okay, so I'm Derek, back. Derek, what a masterful, uh, powerful presentation. Uh, in some ways, I think the best uh, testimony to uh, the strength of your presentation. There are basically no questions yet. I think we've all been riveted by the slides, by your commentary, by your um, explanation, and uh, really a, a, a superb and uh, thoughtful presentation. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm going to give it a minute for a few more questions to uh, come in. And meanwhile, maybe I will ask you, um, you talk about the December election being a third transformation of um, perhaps Israel, perhaps uh, engagement with Israel and Zionism. Uh, two related questions. Uh, where did that sea change come from? Number one. And number two, maybe especially in the context of, you know, to one who doesn't follow Israeli elections that closely, you know, it appears that a few seats change this way rather than that way, and you've got a slender majority this way rather than that way. So on the basis of what appears to be not a huge upheaval in votes, we get this dramatic transformation. What's that all about? Okay, well, it's really good. There's two different questions there, and they're both good, but I just need to separate them. One is about what happened in Israel, and the other is about what's happening here. In other words, the transformation in Israel, you're right, it was just a few seats. And if labor and merits had run as a joint list, and if the united list had kept its, gotten its act together, again, if the left had behaved as ruthlessly and pragmatically as the right, we wouldn't be in this situation. That's true. On the other hand, it is true that a sizable majority of Israeli Jewish voters vote for right-wing parties of one sort or another, right-wing to center. I mean, the, the, the so-called left in Israel among Jews is quite weak. And it's just, it's a few seats in, in, in the Knesset. No, even, even if things had gone well. Um, but you're right, technically this could have been averted. But what did happen is, uh, and in Israel, a 65 seat or 64 seat coalition or whatever is not bad. It really isn't bad at all. But what matters, of course, is the, um, and we knew this in the coalition talks leading up to the formation of the government, the laundry list of, of initiatives that um, religious Zionism, the religious Zionism party, Noam, uh, Jewish power party all demanded and that the Likud itself uh, favored. Um, so this was all coming. And then the question is, why have North American Jews reacted as strongly as they did? Because leading up to the elections, there were expressions of concern, anxiety, worry, trepidation, and a certain sense, I know from the mainstream groups, well, we can't, let's not panic, let's not judge things before there's anything to worry about. Um, and sort of like that APAC statement immediately after the elections. Um, I think it took time. Really, it took about a month, six weeks after the election for the North American Jewish world. And I say North America because I haven't been following and I need to start looking and maybe someone here knows what the reactions in France have been because France has one of the world's largest Jewish diaspora Jewish communities. And I'd be very interested in knowing what the reaction there is. I would imagine that French Jewry in general tends to be more right wing actually than let's say American Jewry, but the leadership it can be quite, um, I would say quite moderate. So it'd be interesting to know how they're reacting. But for North American Jews, it became a real crisis issue around the beginning of the year when it became clear that this government was going to come to power and what they were going to um, initiate. And that, which begs the question, though, why these particular initiatives are so much more upsetting to so many Jews than various things that the state of Israel has been doing for decades. And that's a really interesting question. I mean, I hazarded some guesses. I don't have a definitive answer. Well, uh, not surprisingly, we now have a flurry of questions for you, Derek, that have come from uh, uh, an audience that is digesting your, your presentation. Um, one questioner um, 
put two together. One is uh, a perception that uh, criticism from uh, within the Jewish community of Israel appears to be stronger in the United States than Canada, and wonders if you might have any thoughts on why that is. And as an extension to that, are there any do you think red lines that North American Jewry and its community would not uh, accept from this new government? And for instance, how might you expect uh, the reception for Mr. Smotrich uh, in a month in his visit to, to uh, North America to be? Those are two wonderful questions. I mean, one is uh, the difference between Canadian and American Jewry is something I live with every day, having been born and raised in the States, but moved to Canada a long time ago. Uh, look, Zionism flourished in Canada earlier than in the United States. It was more popular here even before 1948. This is, after all, a multi-ethnic, multinational, or binational society in which difference is not has not historically been frowned upon in quite the same way. It doesn't mean there's no discrimination or hatred or bigotry. There's plenty of all of those. But um, the assimilatory uh, impulse has not been as strong. And also there's the demographic factor that Canadian Jewry is much, much more strongly affected by the Holocaust. That um, so many of the Jews who, the Jews in leadership institution uh, positions today in Canada are the children of Holocaust survivors, were born in DP camps, are Yiddish speakers. They're just so much cl more closely tied to the past. And people who have, you know, been through that experience of the Holocaust, the war years, and their children, they're going to have a fundamentally different view of things. Um, I'm not saying that they're going to be, you know, all on the right or all on the left, but the, the graph will be skewed over sort of one standard deviation. It's going to be different. Um, the other question about red lines, I've had this conversation a lot with friends on the right. I'll say, is there anything Israel could do that would get you to, you know, speak out? Um, and some will just say no, no. And, uh, you know, because Israel's existence is more important to me than, you know, than anything else. People have said that to me. Um, it is possible that North American Jewish groups will refuse to meet with Smotrich. That is possible. Uh, American Jewish groups might. I mean, after all, the Board of Deputies um, refused to meet with him. Uh, was it last year or something? So it's very possible that they will refuse to meet with him. Uh, I would imagine they'd refuse to meet with Ben Gvir. Uh, we'll see which groups do meet with him and which don't, right? Um, but we're in a, the situation is very fluid. And what I really wonder now, especially with the demonstrations in Israel turning violent for the first time, where the police have begun to, you know, to do to Jews what they, Jews never thought the police would do to Jews. Um, it is possible that the American Jewish organizations will have a stronger and firmer sense of red lines. Right now, frankly, I think that the people in these organizations are treading water and playing for time and don't know what to do because they are so invested in Israel in both senses of the word, emotionally and institutionally. The programs, the fundraising, the day schools, the summer camps, I mean, it's all, it's such a huge institutional investment so it's going to take a lot to get people to do things that they think might endanger those. And I use the term investment in a more of a psychological sense than an institutional sense than a financial one. It's going to be hard to give that up. Uh, we'll see with Smotrich. I do think they might draw the line there. Hmm. Derek, there are two questions uh, related to uh, Palestinians. Uh, one is given um, your remarks uh, about uh, what... Uh, might rally Jewish sentiment uh, behind the flag. Uh, one question is, can you imagine um, Israeli attempts to provoke such Palestinian uh, anger reaching uh, the point of uh, some form of uh, rebelliousness? So that's one question related to um, uh, Palestinians. The other is, uh, can you envisage the emergence of a democratic progressive Palestine? Well, I think the first is a little more likely in the short run than the second. Uh, of course, uh, the fact is that the Israeli government and various Palestinian factions, particularly Hamas, but not only Hamas, 
have been playing this game for years, that in a way they need each other. That um, because the rally around the flak effect occurs in all camps, it's not just in Israel, it occurs on the other side as well. Um, but for Netanyahu right now, the master manipulator, I think he's, he might be in over his head. And the problem is that, yes, there'd be advantages to provoking an all out intifada because it could then unleash a rally around the flag effect. But now we have cases where there are reservists who are blocking the road between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. And there's worries that reserve officers in Modi'in and intelligence won't show up for work in the coming days. And you, you just don't know how Israel would respond militarily given how divided the country is. I mean, frankly, I think the state of Israel is more divided now than it was since the Alta Lena affair of 1948. That is the only time in Israel's history when the country came close to a civil war. It was during the 1948 war, there was a truce, the Irgun, uh, right-wing Zionist militia, had a shipment of arms heading into Palestine, the Haganah, the, other, the, the main labor Zionist militia, they knew all about it. But um, the Irgun insisted on keeping weapons for itself, which the Israeli prime minister or the um, uh, prime minister, yeah, David Ben-Gurion refused to accept. And it turned into an all out firefight and dozens of uh, people were killed and the country was on the verge of a state of civil war. And Menachem Begin, the leader of the Irgun basically got his men to stand down. I think we are at that level. And I have to tell you, because I do a lot of work on the 1948 war, that the fears in Israel in 1948 at that time were not of the Arabs. People were feeling okay at that time, that they could handle that. Their fears were about civil war. That's how dangerous this is. So, you know, provoking a Palestinian attack, you just don't quite know what it's going to unleash and whether the civil war in Israel really could only intensify. The other question about Palestine, to be honest, I feel uncomfortable answering that. Uh, I have had a number of conversations lately with Palestinian colleagues uh, because um, I'm not Palestinian. I'm not an expert on Palestine affairs. Sure, I've gone to the territories. I have colleagues. We talk about this. But what I see is a society that is so beaten down. And yes, we can talk about the mistakes Palestinians have made, the corruption and the incompetence and the deviousness and so forth but they've also been so beaten down and denied opportunities. Just today, Tom Friedman was talking about why did the Israeli government actually not support the reformist uh, Palestinian prime minister in the, um, I guess it was the early 2000s, right? Uh, who actually wanted to clean up corruption in the Palestine Authority and create some kind of a viable state. You know, he should have been uh, uh, promoted and protected and instead, you know, he, uh, the Palestine Authority was treated badly. Um, I think it's very hard for us to expect some kind of Western style, liberal, progressive, democratic, um, uh, political movement to take form in such difficult circumstances. Um, and we all know that the Palestinian president is elderly and probably not functioning at full competence, uh, uh, Mahmoud Abbas which raises a whole other set of questions when he does about another kind of civil war within the West Bank on top of the war between Fatah and Gaza that happened about, uh, what, 16 years ago. So um, no, I don't see that happening in the short term. To be honest, I think Israel, the ball's in Israel's court right now. Israel's a much stronger force than the Palestinians. It's a real state, very powerful, and in many ways, a magnificent state. And um, I don't think we can wait around for the Palestinians. I would like to see the Israelis get their own act together because they can. Hmm. Thank you for that, Derek. Um, we've received a, a, a longish post that makes a couple of interesting observations uh, that I think boil down to democracy being flawed in all self-described democratic states. And, um, uh, the suggestion is that with proportional representation, if anything, Israel probably has a closer approximation within its uh, legislature and government of popular sentiment and will. And yes, we have a constitution, but um, in terms of the um, 
charter. Uh, it's over. It's overridden by uh, notwithstanding clause. So there's kind of an implication of like maybe we're throwing stones from a glass house here. Okay. Uh, how do you respond to that? Okay. If this government were a moderate government that believed in the rule of law, and if it were not run by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and featured ministers like Smotrich and you know Ben Gvir, if it were a different government. And that government said, you know, there are certain aspects of the Israeli judiciary that are a bit odd. It's odd that anybody can appeal to the court. It's odd that the court has such wide ranging powers. You know, maybe we need to tinker with it a little bit. Let's have a committee and let's do a you know, multi-partisan study, take a few years to figure it out. We'll tinker with the system. I might say fine, because all political systems need improvement. Absolutely. But that's not what's happening here. This is being rammed through extremely quickly with no forethought in a country in which there are no protections, either cultural or institutional. We don't simply, Israel doesn't have the kinds of protections that let's say Canada does. For example, the notwithstanding clause. The notwithstanding clause is not used on the federal level, it's only used on the provincial level. There's all kinds of charter freedoms and rights that cannot come uh, be affected by the notwithstanding clause. Every attempt that the Israelis have made to say, well, we just want to do what they do in Canada, or you know, we want to do what we do somewhere else, it's disingenuous. Uh, as are what would otherwise perhaps seem to be reasonable criticisms of the court's overreach. Um, I mean, all that happened in the 1990s, the so-called judicial revolution or constitutional revolution, was the Supreme Court tried to make Israel into a Western style liberal democratic regime through the concepts of judicial review um, and through the elevation of the basic laws to constitutional status. If that's going to be changed, okay, maybe, but first it should be done gradually. Second, it should be done with consensus and lots of consultation. And third, it should be meant in the end of the day to enshrine a democracy that is not merely the will of the majority to get back to proportional representation, perhaps representing popular will better than first past the post, but that is a democracy in the sense of the word that it protects the rights of the individual and of minorities. If we only interpret democracy as the will of the majority, then that is another word for tyranny. There's no difference. Hmm. Very powerful words and uh, thoughts there, Derek. Thank you for that. Um, there's a question perhaps from a place of pessimism or you might think realism. Uh, does the current government of Israel even care about what the, what the diaspora thinks? No, no, it doesn't. Um, that's not pessimism, that's just realism. The fact is this government has an alliance with certain pockets of diaspora Jews, Orthodox Jews in North America and throughout the world who are, tend to be quite supportive of the state. Although again, not all are supportive on this particular issue. But there's no doubt about it that the Netanyahu governments, because he's been in power for so long, have given up on the vast majority of North American Jews. And North American Jews will only make a difference not by protesting to the state of Israel, but by trying to influence their own governments which will lead to a lot of painful feelings on the part of Jews in North America, that they are the, um, as it were, the rabbinic concept of the Moser, of someone who is, as it were, informing on another Jew or, you know, going to the, the state authorities to harm another Jew. I and mean, that's, that's actually a big no-no in the Jewish religion. But the fact is that really, a di direct kind of protest to the state of Israel alone is not going to accomplish a whole lot uh, unless it's combined also with direct communication to our, to our governments. Uh, that's why I see my talk tonight is, it's partly about what diaspora Jews can do in terms of practical effects, but it's also what they can do in terms of salvaging or reformulating their own Jewish identities. What will Israel mean to them? in this new environment? What should Israel mean to them? I mean, I'll be quite honest, obviously of the three Ds, I embrace determination. Um, I think that there are all kinds of um, essential qualities about the state of Israel in terms of 
our Jewish civilization that need to be preserved. Um, and that will require both kinds of engagement, engagement with the state and its institutions, but also engagement with our own governments. Hmm. You know, on, on, on the question of identity, we have a, a very interesting question, um, which uh, begins from um, having uh, watched a webinar with uh, the writer Syed Kashua, um, um, Arab, Israeli, Palestinian, who, if I'm not mistaken, writes in Hebrew. Yeah. And um, um, he uh, has long, and in this webinar, reasserted his belief in a one-state solution. Uh, deep breath. Uh, where is where does that prospect now lie? Is it gain? You know, does it have any traction and viability? Well, there actually is one state. <laughs> That's what we have now. There is a single state that has essentially subcontracted certain social welfare and security arrangements to the Palestinians in the West Bank, and the Palestinians have now they disagreed. They stopped security cooperation with Israel. And now they're probably going to start it up again. There really is only one state. You know, every Palestinian baby born in a Palestinian hospital gets an Israeli ID number. Uh, you know, Gaza is this very strange enclave that is surrounded by Israel and Egypt. It's not a state. You know, what is Gaza? It's a, just a very different form of Israeli control, uh, certainly imperfect and incomplete. But um, for want of a better word, there really is one state now. So the question is not going to be, is there going to be a one state solution? The question is going to be what kind of state? Um, I would think that for Bitsal Smotrich, for Itamar Ben-Gvir, and for lots of people in the Kud, um, they want a single state. But they want one that's dominated by Jews, and in which Arabs have, I forget now which Israeli right-wing parliamentarian it was a few years ago who talked about green card status, or basically um, what in Canada would be called landed immigrant status for Palestinians in the West Bank, even though they're born and raised there, they would not be citizens. That's a one state solution. There are other kinds of one state solutions that say Kashua favors and many of my Palestinian colleagues favor, which take two forms. One is a single state with complete equality on an individual basis for every, for every citizen. Uh, another is more of a kind of a binational state uh, where individual and collective rights are intertwined. There is an initiative that some of you are probably familiar with, the um, uh, Two Peoples, One Land initiative, which is seeking some kind of confederation of this sort. Look, the problem is that all of these options are unworkable. Every option on the table is technically unworkable. The two-state option, the one-state confederation, the binational state, or even the one-state option that currently exists is, so it seems, not sustainable. So all of these options, all of these scenarios are improbable. So then the question is, which one do we favor? I think that really comes down to people tend to favor the solution that best meets their psychological and emotional needs. And the two-state option, which has been in the cards now since the Oslo days, you know, there was a time when it was considered anathema. I remember in the late 80s, early 90s, when people talked about a two-state option that was considered, you know, absolutely horrific. Now, you know, many people in the Jewish community have gotten around to accepting that because they want the Palestinian issue to be simply not weighing on them all the time. Um, but the two-state option has terrible um, technical challenges, a very small, poor Palestinian state next to a much larger, much more economically powerful Israeli Jewish state. How could it function? Um, so I think in the long run, in the very long run, we're going to see one form or another of the one state of a one state scenario, not necessarily what I want. If I had my druthers, we would have two states. That's what I think would be for all kinds of reasons. But realistically, I think it's going to be one kind of one state option. And what a lot of younger Palestinians are doing now is they're deciding to, to advocate for a one state in which they're enfranchised. Because of course, if they're the majority of the country, which they would be pretty soon, um, they would dominate the country. I don't think that's going to happen. 
what I see instead, unfortunately, is a situation where Israel becomes more like Lebanon, where you have different nationalities that are, you know, at each other's throats. But I don't think that the Israeli Jewish population would ever let the Palestinians attain the kind of armed power that you saw with the various Muslim factions in, um, in Lebanon. So all this to say, I would like to see a two-state option for all kinds of reasons, but realistically, we're going to be looking at one form or another of a single state. Interesting, as everything you've uh, uh, you've put to us tonight. Um, Derek, there's a question reaching back to one of your earlier slides. Uh, and the question is, can you say more about what Elliot Abrams uh, means or has in mind? Uh, regarding his comment of North Americans clinging to illusions of Israel. And you may want to recontextualize that, that slide for us. Yeah, I think what Elliot Abrams is saying, and it's a very interesting thing among a certain faction of this Jewish right, both within Israel, but even more fascinating in North America, that the very same people who since the 1980s, because a lot of these people came in sort of during the Reagan administration, have been presenting Israel as a model Western style democracy and have been touting things like freedom of speech, freedom of the press, uh, Israel as a haven for LGBTQ people. I mean, basically an island of Western civilization, a villa in the jungle to quote Ehud Barak. These same people are now saying, but of course Israel can't be a Western democracy. Why should you expect that? It's a Middle Eastern country. It's a country in a region where religion and politics are intertwined. There is nothing in the Jewish religion that would incline Jews in some sort of essentialist way to be Western style Democrats. Of course, the state of Israel will be a country where religion and the political system are closely intertwined. And it is an act of uh, arrogance and foolishness for you liberal North American Jews to say anything otherwise. And what's funny is that I've heard the exact same thing from Islamicists in Egypt and in Palestine and in Jordan, who have said the exact same things, uh, that of course we're not gonna have a Western style democracy, that's insulting, we're gonna have an Islamicist variety and you, know, and you need to respect our cultural values. It's very interesting how people, this certain segment of the Elliot Abramsons and a few others have made this shift, this rhetorical shift from Israel as a Western style fortress of democracy to Israel as an authentic Judaic state with certain elements of social welfare and care for one's fellow human being and care for the stranger that are not democratic in any conventional sense of the word. Hmm. Um, interesting uh, uh, next question. Um, in your emotional palette, I'm reading now, in your emotional palette, betrayal is missing. Uh, why? Could North American Jews in dealing with this present trauma of betrayal by Israel turn more to empathizing with the ongoing trauma of occupied Palestinians that have had their human rights betrayed for decades? The answer is maybe. Um, that's a really good point. And um, I've got a chapter in my book this new book on emotions, I have a, a chapter on betrayal, where you can only be betrayed by a friend. You can't be betrayed by somebody you barely know. And most of my chapter is actually about how Israelis have felt betrayed by the world. They felt betrayed by Britain, they feel betrayed by the United States. Because I finished the book a while ago, it's only coming out now, but when I gave a talk in, in, in Munich a few months ago about this, a very bright person <laughs> asked exactly that question, because he said, well, now is the issue a sense of betrayal by diaspora Jews. And this was a German, a Jew in Germany asking the same question, that we've had a certain relationship with Israel and expectations from Israel, and we feel betrayed. Um, okay, so what's the response to the betrayal? Well, when Jews feel betrayed by Britain or by the United States, you know, there's express there can be expressions of anger and complete cutting of ties, or um, engagement of various forms. It is possible, I think, that for certain sectors of North American Jews, particularly the young, uh, there's already, I think, more sympathy for the Palestinians than there, than there was in previous generations. 
it's going to be so hard for the Jews who are in their 50s, 60s, 70s, who have been conditioned with a certain attitude towards Israel and a lot of suspicion towards Palestinians, a lot of suspicion and a lot of fear, great deal of fear. It's going to be very hard for them to, as you're saying, respond to betrayal with a new sense of empathy, particularly because, and here's the difficult thing, we're at a moment now where a lot of Palestinians are just tired of talking to Jews. At this moment, you might think this is a great moment for American, North American Jews to realize, oh my God, you know, look what Israel's doing. Um, we need to reach out to Palestinians. This is exactly a moment where many Palestinian colleagues of mine, they will no longer do uh, dialogue events with Jews. They will no longer reach out to Jews because they feel betrayed and they feel that it has been, it's accomplished nothing unless, and this is something that I don't think very many North American Jews will want to do, unless their Jewish conversation partner is willing to basically just denounce Israel altogether and say, the Zionist entity is a colonial, you know, racist regime, and we all agree that it, it, it has to be fundamentally changed from the bottom up. Only a small minority of Jews in Canada or North America will do that. I think most of them will still adhere to all sorts of attachments to Israel, but there may be greater empathy, but it's going to be very hard for them to find Palestinians at this point with whom they can speak. And I'm talking from my personal experience here, from my own interactions with my Palestinian colleagues. If I can say to uh, uh, everyone who's with us, uh, we are approaching the 8.30 mark when we build this session as ending. Uh, I'm happy to say that uh, Derek has very generously uh, said a little bit of overtime uh, uh, would, be, would be fine. Uh, so I'm going to guess we'll go maybe, here it is, 827, we'll go no more than 15 more minutes, if that. Uh, so I will try to bundle uh, uh, bundle some questions. Um, uh, one question, you touched on this a bit. Uh, what has been the reaction of American Jewry to uh, yesterday's uh, um uh, attack on a, Palestine, a Palestinian village by settlers, which some are calling a veritable pogrom. So if you have any more thoughts that you wanted to share on that. Um, uh, there's a question about whether uh, relation, can relations with other diasporas help us understand each other and views on Israel? Uh, so there's a lot that perhaps could be read or taken into that. I'll let you play with those as you wish, uh, uh, as you wish, Derek, those two questions. As far as the attack yesterday, I mean, I mentioned the, the Orthodox Union response. Yes. It's in, very interesting. I also saw just a few hours ago, and I think it came from the conservative rab rabbinical organization, I forget where, in the United States, that, you know, what happened in Navarro was terrible, but we shouldn't use the word pogrom that the word pogrom should only describe, you know, violence against Jews. Well, then my wife and I were looking up the word pogrom. Well, you know, it's organized, it's, it's violence against members of an identifiable group. The word obviously gained currency with reference to Jews, but the term pogrom has been used in, all over the world, really, to describe violence against various kinds of people. Um, so, I mean, I, I've been reading these press releases from the rabbinic organizations, which on the one hand are quite condemnatory of what happened yesterday, but they're still, you know, but we have to understand the context and we have to understand, you know, terrorism, Palestinian terrorism. And it's true, of course. I mean, the Palestinians murdered Israeli Jews. Um, so it's gonna be this kind of dance about how critical one wishes to be. There still are feeling rules uh, very much in the Jewish community, although I think they're changing. The other question is huge. In general, it's been very difficult for people who, um, let's say, are academics doing diaspora studies to really think of Jews as members of a diaspora because um, mm -hmm. the connection between Jews and Israel is very complicated. It's not like we all came from Israel two generations ago. I mean, if anything, I would be part of a Russian diaspora because that's where my ancestors came, my grandparents came from, right? So it's not a conventional diaspora. Ironically, I was just reading a book yesterday that said the Palestinians don't have a diaspora because most of them live either in or very close to historic Palestine. So I thought, wow, 
<laughs> who does have a diaspora. Hmm. The Jews don't have one and the Palestinians don't have one. Um, on the other hand, there are interactions between Jews and Palestinians abroad that can happen that don't happen within the country. It's easier for Jews and Palestinians they're going to business together, you know, the, the kind of uh, the proverbial falafel stand in New York City that they run together. There are forms of conversation that might be possible uh, here, that might not be possible there. Um, but I don't see an immediate connection, say, with diasporas from Europe or the Chinese diaspora in North America. Um, these diasporas have very specific identities and interests, and they don't really speak that much to each other. Some of these communities are more tightly bound than others, like historically Italian Jewish immigrants, sorry, Italian immigrants and Jewish immigrants had a certain propinquity uh, and certain common cultural qualities. But diaspora as such, I don't think is the defining, is a defining variable. Hmm. You know, Derek, this is in a way a segue to a next question uh, about, because it, it involves homeland. Uh, and I'll read the question. Uh, what is wrong with renaming Jordan, Palestine, and joining it with parts of the West Bank and Gaza, as after all, the king is in exile from Saudi Arabia, and the people in Jordan are essentially Palestinians controlled by the Jordanian army? Um, okay, well, that's, I wouldn't quite typify it that way. I mean, Jordan is the probably the most stable regime uh, of Israel's immediate neighbors, right? And um, I think it's about 60% of the country is Palestinian. And the rest is, uh, or there's East Bank Palestinians, that is people who did not flee or were driven out of Israel or out of the West Bank, East Bank Palestinians, Bedouin, and then the Hashemites, who are a rather small governing elite. Um, it's actually a country that more or less works. There's plenty of problems in Jordan. I've never quite understood why we would want to destabilize one of the very few stable regimes in the area. Yeah. Because if millions of Palestinians come into that country, it's going to be anything but a stable regime. There's going to be uh, the, the Bedouin, the Hashemite communities, the East Bank Palestinians, refugee Palestinians. It's going to be like, like Lebanon. Is that really what we want? So I don't quite get it. On the other hand, there have been ideas going back to 1947 that the solution to the Palestine question, as it's been called, is for Jordan to control the territory that we call the West Bank and for there to be some kind of either just complete control or a confederation between Jordan and the West Bank. These ideas were raised in 47, 49, and they keep on cropping up. The Israeli government raised it in the 1970s it keeps coming back. My answer is very simple. If this is something that the Palestinians want and that can be negotiated with Jordan, maybe it could be considered. But so far as I know, this is not something that any responsible figure in the Palestine Authority or in Fatah wants. There's not going to be peace until we accept the fact that Palestinians need to be thought of as political partners with whom one negotiates, as opposed to people to whom Israel dictates the terms um, of compromise or of agreement. I don't think the Palestinians want this kind of relationship with Jordan, and therefore it would be a very bad idea to try to force it. <laughs> <laughs> Derek, I'm going to exercise uh, moderator privilege to ask you uh, the two final questions. Um, one is uh, historical scholarship proceeds from questions that the historian asks. In the moment we are in now, what's the big question you're asking and wondering about? Well, you asked, okay. One of my final exam questions has been, why hasn't the state of Israel become a falafel republic, which is the Middle Eastern equivalent of a banana republic? That is, why has the state of Israel not had a military coup, and why hasn't it had a civil war? It's pretty remarkable for post-colonial countries 
I mean, so many of these countries, you know, Afro-Asian countries after World War II, it's one military coup after another, civil war. How has Israel avoided it? That's a really good question. My concern is that that question, which has always been put in the present tense, might have to be put into the past tense. That Israel may indeed have some kind of a coup, that Israel indeed may have a civil war. And that terrifies me and it saddens me. Or to use Hillel Halkin's language, it causes me anguish. Hmm. Wow. Um, there's a question that's just come in um, th that uh, um, I think people would want to hear your 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 answer to. Uh, I'll read it as follows. We need to acknowledge the hundreds of thousands of Israelis who have been demonstrating and protesting the current government week after week. How might we maintain our allegiance to the values that this group of Israelis support? That's a fantastic question. You know, I actually am going to share your question <laughs> with my friends in Israel who are going to those demonstrations not just every Saturday night now, but you know, day by day. I know that for those of you who travel to Israel, uh, it's very important to our Israeli friends that we continue to do that. Um, you know, traditionally, uh, we needed Israel. I think right now, Israelis need us, or at least certain Israelis need us. I'm going in a couple of days, so I'm gonna spend a month there. Mm -hmm. And, um, they need this, this sense of support. Now, not everyone's going to get on a plane and go to Israel. But I'm just saying, for those of you who go, it's very important. Uh, I'm not a shill for any particular Jewish charity or Israeli political cause, but I would say if there are certain progressive Israeli organizations or causes that you have supported in the past, I would ask you to increase that support. If you have been on the fence about supporting them, I would ask you to support them. Uh, but I'm going to ask my friends what kind of other gestures you can provide. And if you don't mind, Meyer, I'll, I'll write you back and then you can communicate with, with the audience. Great, great, great. Terrific question. Uh, yeah. I'd be interested in that myself. Derek, uh, um, I've been remiss. I think there's been one question that, that I didn't get to, and I, I'm recalling now, looking at it again, that, that I couldn't quite um, figure out how to pose it. So I'll just read it. Uh, can we? Uh, uh, ap I think this is apropos the question I did ask you about uh, looking forward to a, a, um, um, progressive uh, democratic Palestinian state. The questioner then later went on to say, uh, and maybe it didn't all come through, so bear with me a moment. Uh, such follow-up is such as the revival of the mood of Rabbi Cook. Uh, so I don't know if that prompts any thoughts on your part, but uh, is there anything you'd want to say about uh, um, the rabbi and uh, his place in all of this? There were two kooks. Yeah. There was kook pair and kook fis, Avraham Yitzchak and Tzvi Yehuda. Tzvi Yehuda kook attributed messianic meaning to the territories and would be the last person we would want to look to for inspiration. His father was a much more complicated figure, but he also believed that there was a messianic quality to the Zionist project, even though the secular Jewish Zionists themselves didn't know it. Um, I don't think that the students of the Rav, of Rav Kook, are the ones who are leading the way towards um, reconciliation. You know what I would love Orthodox Jews to do is to take more of an example from Rabbi Menachem Froman, who passed away not long ago. He was the rabbi of Tekoa, which is a West Bank settlement, which was very unusual in that um, he wasn't really interested in sovereignty. He was interested in living on the land, right? The, the land of Israel. And he didn't really see any particular need for this land to be part of the state of Israel. And his whole approach was not typical of the settler movement, and it was sincere. Um, so I think if anyone's going to look to the settler rabbis or from you know or the rabbis who were sympathetic to the settlement enterprise, we might want to look to him instead. It was a really interesting character. Mm -hmm. Derek, uh, I'm going to try to close on uh, uh, what the heck. Can, uh, let's see if I can close on a light note. 
Um, one of the things I like about moderating is when a question comes to my mind that I rule out, not too frivolous, but then somebody who I really respect asks the same question then you know. in, in their chat. Okay, so this has to do with the uh, showpieces uh, over your right shoulder of Mr. Oh. Herzl. Okay, and the question is, you see, you see in, in the bobbleheads, are he, is his civil religion the Star of David or Leafs Nation? Do you all see it? Yep. Number 97? Number 97. Okay, so the Herzl Gallery that you see is because I wrote this book about Herzl. Um, is the, these are all gifts from David Matlow. A Toronto attorney who has the world's largest private collection of not only Herzliana, but a lot of early Zionist material. He's been extremely helpful to me. I've used his yeah. materials for my book. I like this. So this is actually from Israel. This is the hipster Herzl. <laughs> and um, however, I've got to tell you, there's a meme going around Israel of an unhappy Herzl. Um, if you'll just let me share my screen for just a second, I will show it to you. Just a second. Um, hold on, you should see my screen right now, right? Yeah. You? Okay. Oops. What? Do you see unhappy Herzl? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, there you go. Um, I mean, Herzl is, I think, a very good example of how we, we don't despair. Herzl was, I won't go into the whole Herzl book, he was a complicated guy who had a lot of issues, but he found hope and meaning and inspiration. Uh, and I think that we can all do, do the same. You know, as I said, of those three Ds, my own attitude is one of determination. No, Israel is not part of my civil religion, but Israel is a part of me, there's a difference. And um, I think that if we go into the next very difficult months or even years with that attitude, we will, what is it, chazak ve ematz, strong and of good courage, and we may be able to get something done. Hmm. Derek, Derek uh, you've done super heavy lifting uh, tonight <laughs> for us. Um, you know, I, I've, uh, uh, I'm in the same racket as you. Uh, retired from it now. I've heard a lot of academic talks in my day. Uh, this ranks up there among uh, the most impressive, impactful, and informative. So, uh, Derek, I'm sure for everyone on screen, I convey to you our, our huge, huge appreciation and know how much you've shared with us and taught us. Um, I want also to thank uh, Marianne Levitsky, who has her applause hand up, uh, um, as I said that, for uh, making everything flow so seamlessly to Mayor and his committee who organized all this, and of course, to everyone who joined us tonight. This was just a superb, superb uh, insight into tumultuous, uh, challenging times. Uh, Derek, thank you. Thank you all. Be well. Good night. <laughs>